This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Coronavirus cases rise in most African countries, with Lesotho the only country yet to report a case. The COVID-19 pandemic and resultant lockdowns hamper HIV prevention programs in Uganda. And thousands of high school seniors in Hubei, once China's epicenter of the outbreak, return to their classrooms. Hello and welcome to Africa Live on CGTN with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. We'll bring you the details on those stories in just a moment. But first, Uche Okoronko with the day's business headlines, Uche. Thank you, Beatrice. And here's a look at what's coming up on Africa Live Bits. Nigeria amends its 2020 budget to assume an oil price of $20 a barrel. And Egypt to partially reopen hotels and restaurants as it battles the coronavirus pandemic. Of course, more on that coming up within the program, but for now, it is back to you, Beatrice. Uche, thank you. Now, here's the latest on COVID-19 in Africa. That's where we are beginning our broadcast this evening. There are now more than 49,000 confirmed cases of coronavirus and over 16,000 recoveries across the continent. The death toll stands at nearly 2,000. Of the 54 African countries, only Lesotho is yet to record a case. South Africa, Egypt, Algeria and Morocco are the most affected nations. A number of countries are imposing stricter measures as the virus spreads. Here in Kenya, the government is carrying out mass testing in high-risk areas with no data showing how far the disease has spread in Kenya. Some experts are urging the government to rethink its decision to reopen restaurants. Meanwhile, some key activities are slowly resuming in countries like Nigeria, Tunisia and Ghana after the government's eased some restrictions. But the World Health Organization has warned that relaxing measures without boosting care could lead to a new spike in coronavirus cases. Well, health officials in the Democratic Republic of Congo say more than 100 prisoners have tested positive for the coronavirus in Kinshasa's Ndolo military prison. The country's national task force against COVID-19 has begun conducting tests in the overcrowded prison to prevent further spread of the disease. The revelation comes as 797 confirmed cases of COVID-19 have been reported in seven provinces across the DRC. CGTN's Christo Chamringa has more from Kinshasa. According to DRC authorities, three of the infected prisoners have been admitted to a hospital outside the detention facility. More than 90 others are reported to have mild symptoms. They are being monitored by health workers at the facility. The country's COVID-19 National Task Force says it has disinfected the military prison. Human rights bodies in the DRC say the prison has a capacity of 500 inmates, but is currently overcrowded with 5,000 inmates. There are fears that the disease may infect more prisoners at the facility. Since March this year, the government has released 2,000 prisoners detained for low-level offenses to reduce the population of inmates. Chris Sochamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. The COVID-19 pandemic and resultant lockdowns have affected HIV prevention programs across the world. In Uganda, measures introduced to curb the pandemic are threatening to reverse the gains made in bringing down infection rates because patients are unable to access their medicine on time. According to the Ugandan AIDS survey, the HIV prevalence rate has dropped to 6% now compared to 7.3% in 2011. Here's CGTN's Isabel Nakiria. Racing to save the lives of people living with HIV. Simon Bukenya is delivering drugs to patients who cannot access health facilities during the coronavirus lockdown. Bukenya is HIV positive and he understands the importance of taking medication. I decided to help out with the, in my small capacity that I can to save the people that are living with HIV just to reach out to them. Bukenya rides a significant distance outside the capital every day to make sure patients receive their lifeline medicine. His volunteer team has reached over 250 patients during this lockdown. 
but stigma in society poses a challenge to his work as many patients are shy to pick their medicines. When you call them to deliver their drugs, some they don't uh, take you to where they are, some they tell you, you'll find me here, and some other, they, you, they give you their contacts and they're not on. By the time you reach in the field, they're not on, or you reach to their places, their numbers are not on. Over 70% of HIV-positive people in Uganda are on treatment, according to UNAIDS. The daily remedies help fight off infections. HIV caregivers say taking drugs on time makes the virus undetectable and patients can't transmit the disease. The extension of the lockdown is causing more uncertainty and worry among HIV patients. Much as some can access their drugs, HIV caregivers say those who can't risk catching infections like COVID-19 because of low immunity. Reaching all HIV patients is getting even harder after the government banned public and private transport. The other challenge is also going to be increased mother-to-child transmission of HIV, of, of HIV because if mothers not taking their ARVs, children are able to get the ARVs, the medication they're given to protect them against getting HIV. Uganda has managed to prevent new infections among newborns by over 90%. The government has now promised to supply patients with drugs that can last for three months instead of the usual one-month stock. And volunteers like Bukenya say they will continue reaching out to as many HIV-positive people as possible despite lockdown extensions. Isabel Nakiria, CGTN Kampala, Uganda. Tunisian labor and human rights bodies have asked the Spanish authorities to protect Tunisian immigrants in the European nation from the coronavirus pandemic. They are worried about the plight of over 600 Tunisian migrants at an immigration detention center in the Spanish city of Melilla. CGTN's Adnan Chauci has the details. The families of the migrants have defied the lockdown measures. They came from many regions across the country to protest near the foreign ministry office in the capital city, Tunis. The Tunisian Foreign Affairs Ministry must intervene as soon as possible to transfer the migrants to a safe and secure area where health requirements are met on the mainland. The risk of infection is very high in the overcrowded center. More than 170 Tunisian and Spanish associations have called for the suspension of the expulsion procedure for Tunisians housed in the Seti Malila Immigration Detention Center. The announcement about the expulsions was made by the Spanish Interior Minister. The Spanish Interior Minister said that the files of over 600 Tunisians are ready to process for expulsion. We urge him to apologize. It's unacceptable to treat human beings in this way. The world is fighting the coronavirus while Spain is fighting peaceful migrants and putting their lives at risk. The mothers of migrants allege their children are living in deplorable conditions. I speak on behalf of all mothers. Our sons are in a prison in Melilla. It's not a migrant center because they are forced to work. They are often punished and beaten. Food is scarce. Migrants in Spain are not treated as human beings. The group of Tunisian and African migrants includes families with children, pregnant women, and elderly people. Tunisian activists have urged Spain to take all necessary preventive measures to avoid the risk of infection among migrants by strictly complying with the health standards imposed by the World Health Organization. Adnan Shawashi, CGTN, Tunis. Another big spike in COVID-19 cases in Russia. It, is recorded, it has recorded more than 10,000 new infections for the fourth day in a row. Nearly 166,000 people have been infected there, and more than 5,500 have died. Uh, Moscow, ha Moscow has been the hardest hit, with more than half of the country's cases and deaths. Lockdowns are in Russia until at least Monday. Authorities will decide whether to extend or lift restrictions depending on the regions. Russian President Vladimir Putin is chairing a meeting today to discuss gradually easing the lockdown. The British Prime Minister faced Parliament for the first time after taking a month to recover from COVID-19. 
Boris Johnson says he is confident the country can fight the disease and restore the economy. Mr Speaker, when the Prime Minister returned to work a week ago Monday, he said that many people were looking at the apparent success of the government's approach. But yesterday we learnt, tragically, that at least 29,427 people in the UK have now lost their lives to this dreadful virus. That's now the highest number in Europe. It's the second highest in the world. That's not success or apparent success. So can the Prime Minister tell us how on earth did it come to this? Mr Speaker, first of all, of course, every death is a tragedy, and he's right to, to draw attention to the uh, appalling statistics, uh, not just in this country, but of course around the world. And I, I think I would echo really in answer to his question what we've heard from uh, Professor David Spiegelhalter and others. What I can tell him is that at every stage as uh, we took the decisions that we did, we were governed by one overriding principle and aim, and that was to save lives and to protect our NHS. And I, I believe that, of course, there will be a time to look at what decisions we took and whether uh, we could have taken different decisions. But I have absolutely no doubt that what the people of this country want us to do now is, as I said just now, to suppress this disease, to keep suppressing this disease, and to begin the work of getting our country's economy back on its feet. A new study shows that the outbreak in France may have had little to do with cases imported from China or Italy. It revealed another strain of the disease was circulating undetected in France in February. Virologists at the Pasteur Institute in Paris sequenced the genomes from samples taken from 100 coronavirus patients between January and March. They found the dominant type of viral strains in France belonged to a group with a common ancestor of unknown origin. The earlier sample was collected on February the 19th from a patient who had not recently traveled abroad and had no contact with possible carriers. The study has not been peer-reviewed and does not clarify when exactly the virus arrived in France or from where. Germany plans to let the, its state decide how to ease lockdowns. Local leaders would choose whether to gradually reopen public spaces such as universities, restaurants, bars and cinemas. But the plan would allow all shops and amateur open-air sports to restart under certain conditions. Chancellor Angela Merkel is discussing the plan with state leaders on Wednesday. The country has been on lockdown since March. It is reported more than 164,000 infections and nearly 7,000 deaths. The European Union is seeing its deepest economic downturn in its history. Officials say the coronavirus has altered the outlook for the European and world economies. It is now quite clear that the EU has entered the deepest economic recession in its history. The EU economy is expected to contract by a record 7.4% this year, 77 in the euro area, more than in 2009. 2009 contraction was around 4.5%. In 2021, we expect a rebound of 6.1% in the EU and 6.3% in the euro area. Not enough to fully make up for this year's loss. Well, more than a million people have caught the virus across Europe. Over 137,000 have died. The pandemic has devastated consumer spending, trade and jobs. The European Commission says unemployment rate across the 27-nation bloc is expected to rise from 6.7% last year to 9% this year. Italy, Greece, Spain and Portugal will be among the hardest hit. Luxembourg, Malta and Austria are expected to weather the shock a little bit better. In the Chinese capital of Hubei province, high schools in the city of Wuhan welcomed back students today, almost a month after a lockdown a long lockdown was lifted. CGTN's correspondent Feng Yilei tells us more. It's the first day back to school since January. The new semester starts nearly three months later than usual for high schoolers in Wuhan. And with many changes. Shoe sew disinfection, temperature checks, 
Back to school season this year is different than any before it, all because of the coronavirus pandemic. This approaches are the basic guarantees of our study, so of course I can understand that. We've been having online classes at home, and now it's exciting to be back at school. Even the flag raising ceremony has been moved indoors to avoid mass gatherings. And the first lesson is to teach students control measures and contingency plans to keep them safe while on campus. We can see each class has been divided into two smaller ones to make sure each classroom has about only 25 students kept at least one meter apart. And here are some epidemic prevention materials at the door. Also, each class has a spare classroom in case of any emergency situation. If any student shows an abnormal body temperature during class, the rest of the students will be transferred to the spare classroom. The ones with fever will be taken to the observation room. And if the temperature is still high after rechecking, our epidemic prevention staff will contact the community to send them to a hospital. The school has prepared a sufficient amount of protective equipment and has conducted thorough disinfection, which will continue for some time. After classes begin, the school will be closed to the outside until the end of the school day. Students will have their lunch in classrooms with food delivered to them. Teachers and students have all passed CD screening, nucleic acid tests and antibody testing. Only those who tested healthy can be admitted to the school. As for the first batch of students in Wuhan to resume classes, they are facing not only the pandemic but also academic pressure. In just two months, about 36,000 high school seniors in Wuhan will take the college entrance examination. We will definitely improve the efficiency of in-class teaching to be precise and concise. Teachers should not just teach class but should do careful pre-class research and focus on the main problems of students so that students' questions can be solved and training will be more effective. Our students and their parents are full of confidence in the college entrance examination. Given the improving situation, other primary and secondary school students in Wuhan are likely to successively return to school in the near future. Authorities will continue to put safety on the top of the list to ensure that hope and confidence return more and more to the community. Feng Yilei, CGTN, Wuhan. You're watching Africa Live, still ahead on the program. Tunisian migrants face possible expulsion from a detention center in Spain. And in our continuing series on COVID-19 in Africa, we focus on how the crisis has affected Africa's transport industry. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. You've got to get out, go there, and you'll find them in the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo... Who come to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. Along the waters of the Nile. Along the sands of the Sahara. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. And now to our continuing series on the impact of the coronavirus in Africa. Today we are focusing on how the crisis has affected Africa's transport sector. The ban on air travel has had far-reaching implications on the aviation industry across Africa. Among the hardest hit are the little-known baggage handlers who offer crucial services. CGTN's Kalechi Emekalam was at the Abuja International Airport where she spoke to a baggage handler whose job and future now hangs in the balance. Let's listen in. The Abuja International Airport has never been so deserted 
as one of the biggest in West Africa, it has an annual capacity of 15 million passengers. But government has since shut operations here to contain the spread of COVID-19. What the airport authority said that all, everybody is going to be on lockdown until the federal government call us to resume work. So uh, we are still waiting for them to call us. Uh, so far, so good. Since this coronavirus pandemic is arrived, so I have not been doing anything. I only assist my, show, my wife in her shop. As far as you know that we cannot be able to work, we cannot earn salary, and once we cannot go outside, there's nothing you can do to earn money, and you are spending money. Several organizations have been laying off workers as economic activity dips. That has been the case for aviation worker Tijani Abdulrahman, and chances of securing another job are bleak. So I was stuck before. But well, this I make uh, like two to three contacts with some uh, the MDs and the the shareholders, of which they promised me before this uh, coronavirus breakdown. The Nigerian aviation sector alone is estimated to have lost 170 million dollars. In order to cushion the aviation industry, the Central Bank of Nigeria announced an intervention facility of 338 million dollars. Whether or not this will translate into employment gains for Bashir and Tijani is another issue altogether. Kilichia Mekalam, CGT and Abuja, Nigeria. Airlines in Africa and the Middle East have incurred losses running into billions of dollars since the coronavirus pandemic was declared. This is according to the International Air Transport Association. IATA now wants African governments to take action by providing airlines with funding, loans and tax relief. Middle Eastern carriers have lost $19 billion in revenue this year, up from $7.2 billion on March the 11th. And African airline losses so far remain at $6 billion. So, will African airlines survive? Angelo Coppola spoke to IATA's Vice President for Africa and the Middle East, Mohamed Bakari. The financial impact of the coronavirus on continental airlines has been significant. 180 countries implemented measures that limited airline operations and grounded 95% of all global traffic. For the African continent, that figure has been updated to $6 billion losses of, of, of revenues. Now, these billion dollars actually are much needed revenues for the African carriers to stay alive. Besides cargo planes, the only people flying around the African continent are people returning to their home countries. However, the future for airlines remains uncertain. Once lockdowns start uh, getting lifted, you're going to start seeing that the domestic operations are going to get going a little bit quicker than the regional and international operations. And I think largely, that largely depends on the fact that uh, the, each state will probably be looking at its neighboring states as well as international states to say, what is the risk? of the coronavirus being still transmitted if I start to open my borders. In the meantime, authorities may need to get directly involved in ensuring that the airlines can take to the skies again. The initial ask really was uh, devised and formulated around three main pillars. First pillar is capital injection. We really need to inject immediate capital, you know, to those airlines. We also encourage governments and financial institutions to, you know, mean be more flexible and offer loans and loan guarantees and loan bonds to, you know, to enable these airlines to carry out their duties. Uh, and last but not least, uh, tax relief. Restarting an airline isn't a quick process. While staff would be raring to go and aircraft are generally being maintained, it's the service providers that become the focus of attention. You must remember that fuel has is, 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 is been in, in, a, in a pipeline and not been moving for a long time. So they're going to have to get that, that fuel pipeline going, flush it out, get it all ready, or make sure that the, the fuel is all on spec before you start operating. And then you obviously got to get all the other service providers activated. On a continental level, more cooperation is needed. We need the governments to come to us and work with all the stakeholders, airlines and all the other international and regional associations and local associations to participate in building a unified industry restart plan. The airline industry is in a complete state of turmoil at the moment and that's due to the lockdowns in the many different countries. 
once those lockdowns are done away with, we're going to see a different airline industry in the region and on the continent. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Freight forwarders and cargo clearing agents in Zimbabwe have been hit hard by the drastic slowdown in the movement of international shipments due to the coronavirus pandemic. CGTN's Farai Mwakutuya spoke to one freight company that's seen a 70% reduction in activity. Only critical operations staff are reporting for duty at Freight World to process clearance documents for a few remaining inbound shipments. Exports are virtually at a standstill, leaving the company operating at a fraction of its capacity. 20 to 30 percent mm -hmm. of our normal business. Mm -hmm. We are basically clearing essential cargo, mm -hmm. foodstuffs, mining chemicals, mining space, basically. Uh, yet, on a normal day, everything else, you know, Zimbabwe is relied mostly on imports. Mm -hmm. So a lot of imports have, have stopped at the moment. Most of the goods that are coming in are goods that were in the, on the seas, on the ICs, before this corona became a big problem. Mm -hmm. So these are like orders that were placed before, mm -hmm. which are now still coming in and they could not be stopped. Once they've all been delivered, there might not be any big shipments for some time, dimming the prospects for a business that thrives on free-flowing international trade. If the situation remains as it is, obviously uh, companies will close. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that will happen downstream. Yes, we have the essential goods coming in, but that only uh, covers a small percentage of the total imports or exports out of Zimbabwe. So if it remains like this, it looks gloomy. For now, the company is holding on. But if the coronavirus-induced disruptions continue, it's not sure for how much longer. For a month, we'll be able to cope. We we'll may be able to pay salaries. But after a month, it can be a problem. This industry isn't the only one taking a hammering. The Confederation of Zimbabwe Industries, which represents local manufacturers, recently said more than 80% of its members could not afford to pay salaries beyond one month. Its appeal to the government to ease some of the lockdown restrictions to allow housebound employees to return to work so they can get this economy ticking again. Farang Okutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe. In Côte d'Ivoire, the government has ordered public service vehicles to carry fewer passengers so as to reduce the risk of COVID-19 infections. It is feared the confined spaces and limited ventilation in the vehicles could lead to higher infection rates. But many passengers are trying to adjust to the directive, which has also affected the income of drivers and conductors. CGTN Sudisha Balala has more. Two instead of three is the number of passengers now allowed in the back of each taxi in Côte d'Ivoire. After government directed them to reduce the number of passengers they can carry on each trip in efforts to control the spread of the coronavirus, taxi operators across Côte d'Ivoire are feeling the pinch. Many have lost a considerable amount of their daily income. We used to take three passengers in the back and one in the front. Today we're limited to two passengers in the back and one in front. So that makes a total of three passengers instead of four and the fares have not even changed. It's really difficult. We were hoping that the government would lower the price of fuel to support us, but nothing has been done. Today the daily income which was fixed at $23 has gone down to $13. With this decrease, we are not able to feed our families on a daily basis. Really, it's very difficult. Because of the measures to fight against the coronavirus, we can no longer make a profit. It's really not going well at all. It's even very difficult for us. Normally, we should park our cars and stop working. But if we do, how are we going to live? Since coronavirus is spread mainly through respiratory droplets, especially when people cough or sneeze, maintaining a safe distance is recommended to decrease transmission. But due to a lack of space, drivers in Côte d'Ivoire have become more selective to their passengers. Now when you bring your child here to the taxi station, the drivers will not take you just because there's a problem of space. In order to comply with the new measures, 
Drivers give priority to passengers who do not have children, and for those who have children, it is very complicated now to get around. The West African country has also imposed a dusk till dawn curfew, which has contributed to the scarcity of passengers. With over 1,000 confirmed cases of the coronavirus, it's unlikely that Cote d'Ivoire will soon ease some of its preventative measures on public transport. The taxi operators have to brace themselves for tougher times. Tuli Shabalala, CGTN. Well, let's now go to Uche Okoronko for the latest business news. Uche. Thanks, Patricia. And coming up on Africa Live Biz. Nigeria amends its 2020 budget to assume an oil price of $20 a barrel. And Egypt to partially reopen hotels and restaurants as it battles the coronavirus pandemic. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Well, let's start off in Nigeria. The government is amending its 2020 budget to assume an oil price of $20 per barrel. Finance Minister Zainab, Zainab Ahmed also says that Nigerian oil and gas projects will be delivered much later than originally planned, and that's due to upstream budget cuts. Now, Nigeria's economy emerged from a recession in 2017 and was already contending with a low growth of around 2% before oil prices plummeted. Africa's top oil exporter relies on crude sales for around 90% of foreign exchange earnings and more than half of government revenue. Global crude oil prices have plummeted in the last few months. Back in March, the finance minister said the budget will be cut and the initial assumed oil price of $57 per barrel would be reduced. Well, still in the country, Nigerian officials have announced that the oil and gas sector will not hold bidding rounds for major oil fields until crude prices recover. The continent's largest oil producer has been grappling with a significant drop in oil prices and a collapse in global fuel demand caused by lockdown measures. This follows the coronavirus pandemic. Here's CGTN's Jane Keo with that report. In 2010, Nigeria enacted the Nigerian Oil and Gas Industry Content Development Act to boost dominance in the oil and gas industry. With the recent increase in developments, the country has managed to phase out the supremacy on the continent by international operating companies. All engineering design, uh, conceptual, front-end, detailed engineering design were done outside the country. Uh, but today, as we speak, 80% of all engineering design in the oil and gas industry is done in country, which is a major achievement. Uh, you can imagine the capital flight when we did uh, all those kind of design outside the country. Extraction of oil and gas requires precision, leaving little room for error. This has often forced the Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board to lean on the international operators to ensure they did not engage in a practice known as fronting. Oil companies used to give people work and tell them to go and sit at home. So they will come and claim that I've employed 20 people from the community, but we don't have space for them to work. So we just pay them at the end of the month. That's damaging to humanity. The transformative legislation has allowed the country to retain highly skilled professionals and ensure that the Nigerian operators can now compete with the best in the world. The IOCs, uh, I will say, trust the work we produce from our yard. They trust us for the quality, they trust us for the schedules, they trust that 
we will do these works, we will build this equipment under the strongest safety conditions. Because what they want to see is everybody who comes to work every day return home safe at the end of the day. Despite the recent development in the sector, revenues are expected to decline owing to the recent coronavirus outbreak. With the country heavily relying on crude oil sales, it has been forced to assume a lower petroleum price of just $20 per barrel. Jin Keo, CGTN. And heading to Egypt now, the country is finalizing plans and regulations for hotels to reopen as it battles the coronavirus pandemic. Now, COVID-19 has hit the country's tourism sector the hardest, with losses estimated to exceed $2 billion. Partial operation is expected to lift some of that financial pressure. Here's CGTN's Adil El Marhoui with more. Primarily projected to be the best year in tourism revenues, under the pandemic, 2020 could now be the worst. Tourists have initially started to book trips in November. Until they arrive, the government has decided to reopen hotels for locals. The government prohibited layoffs of hotels and tour operators on the condition that it will pay for that cost. The country is capable of paying for a month or two, but what if the pandemic lasts longer? That is why we move towards partial resumption of hotels and operations. Hotels will be restricted to a 25% occupancy rate. Visitors will not be allowed to cluster, so open buffets, nightclubs or entertainment activities will not be allowed. It is not enough. The hotel will be burdened with overheads and fixed costs. When the feasibility study is made for the hotels, we put a risk factor, and that brings their break-even at 60% occupancy, so 25% is unreal. But it's better than nothing, and it's also an opportunity for the staff to get trained. In addition, hotels must hire a full-time medical staff trained for COVID-19. Rapid tests must be available, and disinfection measures to people and facilities will take place on hourly basis. I would have wished that the opening of the hotels would be implemented after we have formed a detailed procedures manual that would dictate what will the receptionists do, how will the housekeeping work, how will we manage the public spaces, will pools be working or not. The government is still working to draft the regulations guidelines for operation while COVID-19 threats persist. Hotels interested in taking these additional necessities can apply to join this partial reopening program. With a 25% occupancy rate ceiling, additional hygienic and preventive measures, running costs for hotels are going to be phenomenal. So instead of offering price cuts to attract clients, many may need to increase them, which will be a challenge to appeal to local visitors who have been suffering from the recession COVID-19 caused. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. Meanwhile, Uganda has extended its lockdown for two more weeks, but also eased restrictions on some sectors of its economy. Restaurants, wholesalers, motor vehicle mechanics and legal practitioners have been allowed to resume work, but with strict prevention measures. Here's CGTN's Hilary Ayesiga reporting. A gradual return to the new normal. Uganda has been under partial lockdown for more than 45 days but parts of the economy are starting to reopen. The criteria is premised on the following issues. Number one is contribution to the economy or the economic impact and potential to mitigate the risk based on the sector activities and crowding. Three, the socioeconomic vulnerability and finally, expanded capacity for surveillance, testing, and care as more sectors are opened. In downtown Kampala, business is gradually picking up. But authorities and business owners are still concerned about the spread of COVID-19. So it could take a while for all the shops here to reopen. For now, some key sectors remain closed. Travel by public transport or private vehicles is still banned. And schools and entertainment centers will remain to stay shut to prevent large gatherings. But as the government relaxes the measures, 
there has been a spike in imported cases. So the reopening has drawn mixed reactions from the public. As far as the disease is spreading, it is safe for us to keep home. But then the major thing disturbing Ugandans is, is income. Ugandans are very poor and it's really pushing everyone down. They allow these people to move in a, in a holiday. Uh, the, this disease may increase and uh, these people, most of the people, they may die. To extend it wasn't be bad, but in my view it was like he would let people work, but he would be putting some measures that everyone should be checked. Uganda has recorded low numbers of coronavirus. To keep it that way, authorities are doing mass testing of transit truck drivers, border communities, and also policing unchecked border points. They hope that these and other measures will help curb the spread of the disease and prevent the need for yet another lockdown. Hilara Yesiga, CGTN, Kampala. Uganda. Well, that's all for now on Africa Live Biz. But coming up later on Global Business Africa, Ethiopian Airlines is in talks to rescue some airlines across the continent, including Air Mauritius. The airline is even open to negotiations with South African Airways that is being wound up. We'll have more on that coming up at the top of the hour. For now, it is back to you, Beatrice. Uche, thank you. And we still have more news, views, and analysis for you here on the program. Here's what's ahead. We'll be speaking to a South African writer, Zukiswa Warner, winner of this year's Gothi Medal Award by the German government. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. The greatest journeys, the greatest sights, the greatest adventures. Here in Panater, this year, allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. Women in Sudan are celebrating as they await the ratification by transitional authorities of the ban on female genital mutilation. The country's cabinet has already approved amendments to the criminal code that will punish those who perform the operation with up to three years in prison and a fine. The practice has long been viewed as a rite of passage for girls and a way to preserve their chastity. According to the United Nations, nearly nine out of ten females in the country fall victim to the practice. Rights groups have for years decried FGM as a barbaric. They say it has countless complications and in the worst cases, the girls die. Sudan is in the process of a political transition following the ouster of former President Omar al-Bashir early last year. A new administration is now steering the country through social, economic and political changes. Hakam Ibrahim was seven when, like most Sudanese girls, she became a victim. Female genital mutilation is one of the very harmful traditions. It's almost as sacred as a sharia or the law currently in force. Before, people would get hina tattoos, cheer and celebrate to mark a genital cutting. Our mothers and grandmothers believe that female circumcision is a kind of a pleasure and creates a happy married life for the girl. But it is among the bad customs. A South African writer, publisher and curator, Zokiswa Wana, has become the first African woman to be awarded the Gotti Medal, an official honor awarded by the German government. Founded in 1955, the award is conferred by the Gotti Institute on individuals who have made an outstanding contribution to international cultural exchange. Here's Zokiswa's story. Zogi Savannah, I am a South African from my dad's side. My mom is Zimbabwean and I was born in Zambia. 
And I'm now saying in Kenya, the people in Europe perhaps sometimes want a certain type of African story. The stories that I was writing resonated more with this continent and I wanted my books more on the continent, so that's my big emphasis. In 2018, the Guta Institute in invited me to, um, to give them an idea of a new literary idea and I said, well, you know, we don't have enough writing for 13 to 19 year olds. I did a call out for stories, for short stories for young adults. And we got 435 stories from 28 African countries. Selected 17 stories from 13 African countries. And each of the stories, you know, the English ones were translated into French and Kiswahili, the French into Kiswahili and English, the Kiswahili into English and French. The first thing that I started doing was uh, artistic encounters. What I had in mind was finding a way of making people more aware of the literature of this continent by writers from this continent. And so in it, I engaged a prose writer or a poet from this continent and they'll be put together with, with say a musician or a dancer or an actor. And in this way, people didn't, people realized that our, our literature is accessible. Um, I've been shortlisted for the Commonwealth before. I've been, I've, I've, won, a, I've won an award for my writing, but this particular, the Gute Medal is, encompassing you know my my writing it's encompassing my my curation my publishing and uh, my editing so essentially my whole career I hope it will say be true to yourself just be true to yourself and your work will shine through which is what I've consistently tried to do well, let's now take a look at your sports news here's what's ahead South African runners come up with alternative ways to stay fit during the COVID-19 lockdown. How would you create your legend? On the fields. On the tracks. In the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports Scene. Find your game. Africa Live. Find your voice. The COVID-19 lockdown in South Africa has made runners come up with alternative ways to stay fit and benefit from their and benefit their favorite charities. Bunny Rooks, a trail and marathon runner from Pretoria, recently ran 90 kilometers in one day in his backyard. This is the equivalent distance of South Africa's grueling Ultra Comrades Marathon. CGTN's Julie Shire has the story. Quarantine mandates around the world are forcing people to make big changes to their lives and workout routines. South Africa is known for its great races like Two Oceans, Ultra Marathon and 90 Kilometers Comrades. But this pandemic has changed everything. Events have been cancelled and with South African runners not even allowed out for a run, many have had to adjust. Marathon and trail runner Benny Roo took up a challenge to run 90 kilometers in his backyard, all in the name of charity. It wasn't easy. I wasn't really up to the challenge because some of my friends did dare me to do it. I first started off by doing 42 kilometers and then the challenge came to do the comrades distance, 90 kilometers. But then I said, no, wait, guys, I'll only do it if there's a charity involved. And um, I actually managed to, to raise about 70,000 francs uh, for a school for disabled children and children with um, autism. What fuels you? What makes you get out of bed and get going with all these goals? You need an obstacle to create a solution. You won't get to the solution without an obstacle. And you know, obviously the lockdown is the obstacle. There's also a lot of positive things from this lockdown. Me and my wife, we're both runners. So many times we sacrificed not running because somebody had to stay with the kids if we don't have a babysitter. And yeah, the lockdown 
we actually see that we can both run at the same time and watch the kids. Rue had to run 360 laps of his 250 meter long garden route to finish his comrades challenge. It took 10 hours and 29 minutes and inspired many other runners. He's been a big inspiration, I think, to a lot of people. And watching him, he ran comrades. He was one of the first that I saw that ran comrades in his garden. And that motivated me to do, I did a, a 43 kilometer run around my garden, which took close to six hours. Becomes like a bit of a challenge. Even though it's long and boring, you kind of like, I have to finish this. I can't start it and not finish this. The 90 kilometers comrades marathon has earned its reputation as one of the toughest races out there. Due to COVID-19, it's been postponed this year. But runners are keeping the dream alive, even if it's in their own backyard. Julie Scherer, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa.